Well, Jay Powell was uh, a person who had been in, in, in the investment banking world at Dylan Reed. Somebody put us together and I interviewed him. He came in and was in our firm for seven or eight years and did a very good job. He's now obviously the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So I think the Fed is basically going to, I think, pause a bit and not increase interest rates as much as they once thought they were probably increased this month. I suspect you'll see a very modest increase in the next in the next six months relative to what people once feared. You're going to be good in finance if you enjoy it. Don't do it because you just want to make more money. If you think uh, the only purpose of being in finance or investing is to making money more than you might make in some other profession and you don't really don't enjoy it, then it probably won't be for you. I am honored to welcome to Forward Guidance, David Rubenstein, co-founder and executive chairman of the Carlyle Group. David, great to have you here. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. David, you are the author of How to Invest, Masters on the Craft, where you interviewed uh, a series of legendary investors. And David, I have to admit, I had a lot of interview jealousy as someone who tries and uh, seeks to interview uh, you know, successful investors myself. You interviewed Jim Simon, Stan Druckenmiller, Sam Zell, and so you interviewed the best interview, um, investors in the world. What were the common traits and dispositions, frameworks that you identified? What makes a great investor a great investor? Well, of course, a lot of them had luck, of course, because uh, they put themselves in the right place to do what they did. But the common characteristics, I would say, are these. One, they tend to come from blue collar or lower middle class families, not from very wealthy families. They tend to have been pretty good students. They tend to have... um, uh, a very good appetite for reading anything. They just don't want to read just what might be their area of expertise. They have an, an insatiable appetite for knowledge and reading. They tend to be people who um, were, are willing to share the the, uh, the credit with their, their colleagues, but also take the blame. When they make a mistake, they know they made a mistake and they get out of it relatively quickly and don't linger around it, trying to prove that they were really right when they were not. They tend to be people that are go against the conventional wisdom, the conventional wisdom that says sell this or buy that. They tend to be the opposite of that. They tend to enjoy what they're doing more than um, than than pleasure. Uh, in other words, to them, this is pleasure and it's not work. Uh, when they're very successful, they tend to be extremely philanthropic. They all tend to be pretty good in math. Generally, they're not mathematicians necessarily, but they have pretty good skills in math. And generally, I would say that they all... Um, you know, recognize that they had some luck along the way and and therefore they probably have a fair amount of humility because they've all had some failures. They've all made mistakes. That tends to make you humble and therefore you don't see that many arrogant people at this level. What's the importance of finding a specialization? So, f- for example, a student would stand Druckenmiller, a macro investor who's following GDP, what central banks are doing, interest rates, currencies. That's very different from your world, the world of private equity. To what degree do different that parts of the investment world uh, have a need a slightly different skill set uh, to to succeed. Well, of course, they're all different uh, kinds of skill sets. Some are ones where you got to be very quick to be trader, a very good trader. Private equity, you don't have to have the trading skills, the quick uh, ability to read a screen or something like that. You have much long elongated uh, times to to analyze a deal or to weigh in uh, whether the deal is going to work or not. I'd say that. Um, each of these people tend to specialize in one area or another. Now, in Stan Druckenmiller's case, he tends to be a, both a macro investor, but also a stock picker. That's very rare. Usually you're stock pickers or you're macro. He tends to do both. And he also has a very clever way of avoiding people asking him for investment advice because he says, look, I change my mind every day. So I can't tell you something because I might change my mind tomorrow. So he and he does change his mind a lot. And when he makes a decision about changing his mind, he gets out of his position very quickly. He just say, yesterday I thought X and today I believe Y and I therefore get, should get out of X. So he's fairly humble about it, but he's obviously got a great track record. Now let's journey to your world, the world of private equity. When you uh, founded Carlisle Group in 1987, what, what, what you, know, you decided you wanted, did you know you wanted to do private equity uh, always, or did you choose the investment world? And you said, okay, now I'll choose a, a field. Uh, well, the phrase private equity really hadn't even been invented. <clears throat> At that time, we were called leverage buyout firms and things like that. Um, I didn't have any background in the business. And I thought maybe, you know, I, I, I could start a firm with people that knew something about finance and I could learn along the way. And I didn't really learn how to be a great investor, as I say in the book. I My skill set was raising the money or 
or coming up with a way to develop new um, uh, build, uh, new funds for Carlisle, thinking of st strategies that would help us grow the firm, recruiting people, and being the public face of the firm. But I, in many ways, the, my partners were the real investors who really did the day-to-day -day work of analyzing the deals and overseeing them. Um, but I, I thought if I went into the trading business, there, I wouldn't be able to add that much value. And what I probably did the most to help Carlisle was being willing to go on the road and raise money. And I did it, you know, roughly, you know, for uh, uh, for 30 some years, basically to be the person who would raise the money and develop the relationships around the world. Some of them led to deals, but generally my partners would analyze the deals. Mm. And so the, the Carla Group has an extraordinary track record. Uh, right in the book, the gross internal rate of return since the founding has been roughly 26 percent, uh, generated uh, slightly over a quarter of a trillion dollars uh, in returns. Uh, what is sort of the, the secret of generating uh, sustainable returns that are excellent? Uh, you, know, every, you know, a lot of people have a good year, but in terms of being consistent as well as being able to develop those great returns once you're a very large firm, what is sort of the secret of the Carlisle Group's success? Well, there are many things you need to do to do that. You need to have, a, uh, I, I think, a level head, not get carried away with the latest trends. Uh, don't get caught up in things that might seem hot for an hour or two, but in the end, they're not going to be sustainable. Focus on, in the buyout world, paying down the debt and not on other things that may not be as important as paying down the debt in, in a timely way. Also, making sure that you have a culture in the firm which incents people to want to work hard, to learn, to get along with other people. And, and that kind of a culture, I think, is very successful, very important for a successful firm to, to go from one generation to the next generation. So I'd say all the other large private equity firms like ours, Blackstone, KKR, Apollo, have common sets of principles that have enabled them to move forward as well. But generally, they've tended to be relatively consistent and they do an enormous amount of analysis and they really try to add value to these companies that they buy. Mm. And one of my favorite interviews you do in the book is with uh, Sandra Horbach, a senior investment uh, professional at the Carlisle Group. And you really get into the business. And you ask the question, how has the private equity world changed since you joined? So I, I'd like to ask you the same question. And I'd like to perhaps focus on uh, two things. Uh, one is the, the valuations, how they changed, as well as sort of the debt profile. I think in the interview you did with Ms. Right. Horbach, uh, she noted that there used to be more debt and less equity, whereas now there's more equity. Well, yes. Um, in the early days of private equity, there are very few firms. The, in the early, early days of private equity, the firms were five or six or seven people. KKR had seven people when they did the famous RJR deal in 1989. In that deal, it was 5% equity, 95% debt. And it wasn't atypical in the, or in the early days, in the 70s and 80s, to have 1% to 5% equity. And some of that equity would come out as a fee. So some cases, people would put 1% equity in and take it out as a 1% fee. They have no equity in. Uh, today, the equity component may be 50% and something like that. A second change is that people accept this as an important part of the investment world. In the early days, private equity and buyouts were seen as an, a kind of an unusual thing, very, very exotic, and not something you could really put uh, institutional money in. Now, almost every institution that invests across the board will have some private equity kind of uh, uh, elements in their portfolio. So I think the industry is better accepted. I think more people are willing to work in it. I think we also, one other major difference is in the old days, you tended to use a lot of leverage and a lot of financial maneuvering to kind of make your returns. Now, there's a lot of added value that comes in from the people that have uh, experience who work at firms like ours, where they're operating executives or CFOs, they're technology people, and they go in and help the company. And so it's more of a what we call EBITDA growth than just um, financial engineering or multiple growth, which means you're buying it at 10 times EBITDA, but you hope to sell it at 12 times EBITDA. We, we don't try to do that anymore. Mm. You mentioned when uh, in the early days, private equity wasn't uh, seen as much of a stable asset class. It was, it was a, on the cutting edge. Um, do you think it's a benefit to get started early in a, something that's a cutting edge as it moves more towards the mainstream, which private equity definitely is now? And then or in, in the introduction to the book, you note how there may be fields that are on the cutting edge now that uh, if sure. they prove to, to be more mainstream, they will be similar. Um, you talked about ESG, infrastructure investing, SPACs, as well as crypto. Yes. I mean, uh, those are kind of investment areas. Private equity is a type of investment uh, kind of uh, format, I guess I would say. But I would say that um, today, if you're on the ground floor of anything that makes some sense, it probably will be good for you. 
Um, obviously, those who are on the ground floor of crypto may or may not uh, benefit in the time. We don't know where crypto is going to come out. That there are other areas of new new um, technologies that are likely to change the way we live, and those technologies are probably going to be very important as people invest in them. May not be necessarily easy to do those in buyouts, but in venture or growth capital. For for example, computational biology. Um, I would say quantum uh, computing. Uh, other types of biotech, CRISPR-related investments, things like that, that probably are going to change the way we live and, and, and work over the next 10, 20 years. Being on the ground floor of them will probably be helpful as well. You spoke earlier about the importance of being a contrarian investor, how that's key for investment success. Uh, is there an example from your career or from the, the history of the Carlyle Group where being a contrarian investor uh, uh, resulted in a great investment uh, result? Well, I would say I would put it in this way. When we started the firm, private equity firms were basically firms that did this. They tended to be in one city. They tended to invest in their country and they tended to focus just on buyouts. Our novelty was, if anything uh, can be considered novel, was that I decided what we should do is have multiple funds, not just a buyout fund, but have a real estate fund, a growth capital fund and many different funds. Take advantage of our brand name and also build up uh, the ability to have bigger infrastructure and so forth. And then secondly, to globalize it. Historically, Americans invested in America, Europeans in Europe, Asians in Asia. And I decided we would have an American firm with a dedicated European team, a dedicated Asian team, a dedicated uh, Japanese team, and so forth. And we did that. And that was novel at the time, quite contrary, and people made fun of it. Now, obviously, the other big firms have done the same thing in some ways better than us. Mm. Uh, you, you said earlier that there were other professionals early on in Carlisle who – uh, made a lot of key investment decisions and you, you know, in a humble way, downplay the importance of raising money, uh, operational stuff, but that stuff is that th those roles are extremely important. Uh, what to, to what do you attribute, you know, if, if someone wants to raise money or they, they want to run a firm, uh, what are, what are some, some advice you might have on the leadership front or on, on, on fundraising? Well, fundraising is an interesting phenomenon. If you go to Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School or any good business school or any bad business school, I doubt that you find a course anywhere in any of the curricula uh, which says, here's how to fundraise. But the truth is, most people in the professional world are asking other people for something. Usually money is one of the things they're asking for in many different contexts, but it's not something that's taught. And therefore, uh, when I became uh, involved with Carlisle and started Carlisle, I wanted to make myself useful. I didn't have the finance skills that my partners did. So I said, you guys analyze the deals and oversee the investments. I'll raise the money. In the, historically, fundraising was at the lowest part of the totem pole in private equity. You know, people want to be the CEO. They want to be the top deal person, um, so forth. Nobody wanted to do fundraising. And so I did it uh, at the time. Now, and people more and more want to do it because they recognize that if you can raise money and do it successfully, you're likely to get a big fund. And if you have good people to invest it, you should do pretty well. Mm. Uh, right. David, what was your favorite interview that you did within the book? Um, and we might expand it to with not only within the book, but the interviews that you've done on your show on Bloomberg uh, peer to peer. Well, it's like asking me which of my three favorite children are, uh, you know, <laughs> I like the most. I won't say that. I would say I liked all the people who gave me an interview. Uh, some of the interviews I thought were quite instructive. Uh, we talked about Stan Druckenmiller was quite interesting because he rarely gives interviews and he talked about his philosophy a bit. And um, it was quite unusual in terms of the way he is relatively modest and changes his mind a lot. Seth Klarman almost never gives interviews. Mm -hmm. And he gave me an interview in part because he had asked me if, if he could interview me for something. And I said, OK. And then I later went back and said, well, can you return the favor? Michael Moritz is an incredibly in, uh, gifted investor. He more or less built Sequoia into the most successful venture firm in the history of the world and um, done it from a background of uh, being an immigrant from Wales and, and with a journalist background. Paula Volent, who runs the Rockefeller, Foundation, Rockefeller University Endowment, she had run the Bowdoin Endowment for a number of years and actually beat her mentor the last 10 years. Her mentor was the legendary David Swenson, the Yale Endowment chief. And she actually outperformed him the last 10 years of her time at Bowdoin. So she's an incredibly gifted investor. Or, um, you know, other people like uh, John Rogers, African-American who built the largest African-American investment firm called Ariel Capital. I love all the interviews in the book as well as on your, your show. One of my favorite interviews might be uh, one where you begin the interview by saying, 
a number of years ago, a gentleman walked in my office and he was a lawyer. He said, I want to work in private equity. I was impressed with him. And his name was Jay Powell. Um, so you've done two, two interviews, uh, perhaps more with Jay Powell, who's now the, uh, as my viewers know, F uh, Federal Reserve Chair. Well, Jay Powell was uh, a person who had been in, in, in the investment banking world at Dillon Reed. He came down to work in the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. And after he left that, he didn't want to move back to New York. And we were in Washington. And uh, somebody put us together and I interviewed him. He came in and was in our firm for seven or eight years and did a very good job. He's now obviously the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I interviewed a person about 25 years ago who was a very talented young man. I thought he had a good career ahead of him, but he ultimately left to run for governor of Virginia. His name is Glenn Youngkin. And now mm -hmm. people think he's running for president of the United States. So you never know what people are going to uh, turn out to be. Uh, I, you asked me earlier, what is my favorite interviews of all the ones I've done? And again, I, I can't pick any one out, but I would say one of the most favorite, favorite, one of my most favorite ones was with Jeff Bezos, because I did it in front of a live audience. When you have a live audience, you can play to the audience more, and the and and there's a lot more excitement in the in the room. I also think that um, interviewing uh, Oprah Winfrey in front of a live audience was also quite interesting because she's a master interviewer. Interviewing George Bush and Bill Clinton together was quite interesting. Uh, not long ago, I interviewed Sylvester Stallone, which was. Quite, quite interesting. And I had really that much experience interviewing actors. But um, so, you know, I think I try to prepare for all my interviews and, uh, you know, get into the character uh, such that I really feel like I can have an intelligent conversation with them. Mm. Um, so uh, another live interview you did, you did was, I think, at the Economics Club with Jay Powell. And I believe it was in very early 2019, I think January of 2019. So at a time that was now you know, people in the financial media and, and investors call the Powell pivot when uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell s stopped hiking yeah. rates and ultimately later in 2019 began to uh, cut them. I, I wonder if you have any uh, uh, memories or insights from that period, because as you know, so many in the investment world now are waiting uh, with bated breath on what they expect to be the next Powell pivot. And as you know, the Federal Reserve has rated uh, interest rates uh, uh, drastically this year. Well, I don't expect he's going to be lowering interest rates anytime soon. But at that particular time, he had been criticized by President Trump, who appointed him to be the chairman for raising interest rates. Eventually, he lowered them in part because uh, uh, of the economic situation and deterioration relating to COVID, among other things. And so now people are wondering how much higher he's going to take interest rates before he begins to say we need to pause more and, and lower them a bit. I don't expect interest rates will be lowered probably until the latter part of this year. I, I don't have any inside information on that. I suspect that he's uh, feeling he's not increasing them as much as people once feared, and that may be viewed by some as a lowering, but I suspect the increases we'll be seeing in the future will be quite modest. Hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, at the beginning of this year, interest rates were at zero, and as inflation gradually, uh, went, not gradually, went, went up to, I think, uh, 9%, the the differential between 9% inflation and very low interest rates uh, was was quite stark, leading some to think that, you know, the Fed Reserve was too, was, was too late. Um, yeah. How have you thought about the, the Federal Reserve's uh, fight, fight with inflation? Well, the Federal Reserve, uh, by its own admission, uh, made a mistake. They thought that the inflation rate when it was high was transitory maybe because of COVID or supply chain interruptions. It turned out not to be quite as transitory as they thought, and they admitted that, and therefore they began to increase interest rates. At the moment, we see inflation and many costs and key products like gasoline coming down. So I think the Fed is basically going to, I think, pause a bit and not increase interest rates as much as they once thought they were probably increased this month and also uh, in the early next year. I suspect you'll see a very modest increase in the next in the next six months relative to what people once feared. Mm, that's very interesting. And yeah, the interviews that you did in the book um, uh, were filmed in 2021 and, and maybe 2022. And it's very interesting to see these great investors' thoughts during the time. Like Ray, Ray Dalio, Larry Fink, John Paulson, uh, they share their view on inflation and some of them saying, yeah, I don't think uh, inflation is so transitory. What do you think the, the cause of inflation is? I know you do a lot of thinking about this on your own. I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, research from your team. Uh, some people say it's mostly supply driven because of increased commodity prices. Others say, no, there is a structural demand push. Um, and do, do you have any view on to what degree it might be secular uh, as in long lasting as it was during the 1970s? 
The 1970s was a different world. Uh, 25% of our workforce in the United States was unionized. Uh, now it's maybe 10%. And most of the products and, uh, that we, and cons- services we consume were produced in the United States. Today, because of the fall of, of, of uh, communism, more or less, or the end of the Cold War, I should say, and the rise of China as a producer of so many products, we have more or less lowered the cost of production, therefore lowering inflation. And that's been a big factor. Uh, today, I would say that uh, uh, in, in, in the inflation rate is probably going to be coming down in part because of the Fed has done, but also because uh, you know, we're not faced with the crises that we had, at least not now, that produced higher inflation. Higher inflation was caused by $5 trillion of additional spending by the uh, Trump administration and Congress and the Biden administration in Congress that was put into the economy with no tax revenues offsetting it. Secondly, the Fed basically took interest rates and kept it at zero, and they had quantitative easing, which facilitated even more inflationary kinds of things. And uh, as we've been begun to buy less from China, a bit, a bit less, it's also had some inflationary impact. So has the war in Ukraine, because energy prices spiked up, food prices spiked up, as those supply chains were interrupted. So many of these factors produced the higher inflation. To what degree do you incorporate uh, as an investor? And do you think that if people want to become excellent investors, they should incorporate uh, macroeconomics and the business cycle? There are times when uh, times are good and uh, investors pile money into risk assets and perhaps they get a, they exceed fair value. And then there are times when uh, the other the uh, trough of the of the of the, the, the wave when uh, things are, are trading at bargain prices. Uh, do you think that it is? appropriate to pay attention to that? Do you think that people can err by paying too much attention onto it so they save up too much cash so they don't actually deploy a much investment? You know, yeah, what, what do you think? Well, if you are paralyzed by the fact that the world always has problems, you won't invest, then that's not a good thing. You have to recognize that you're always going to have challenges, uh, things that are unforeseen and so forth. I do think that good investors do look at macro factors and try to put them into context. And as I say at the beginning of the book, all of investing is really about predicting the future. Who is really good at predicting the future? Well, nobody's perfect at it. But essentially, you're trying to predict what's going to happen macroeconomic-wise, energy-wise, and a whole variety of other factors next six months, next year, next five years. And so the ability to know more about those subjects probably does help somebody become a good investor. But as I said earlier, having an, 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 um, a great thirst for knowledge and really to read everything and hear from people different perspectives is probably something all investors who are great really have. Mm. Um, the the stimulus in March, uh, in, in stimulus in 2020, uh, you mentioned the fiscal stimulus as well as monetary s- stimulus. Uh, we talked about the, that impact on inflation, but what about the impact on asset prices? You know, I, as someone who pays largely attention to public markets, you, you, know, you could see very low credit spreads, very high equity valuations, meme stocks, crypto, Dogecoin is, I guess, an extreme example of that. Uh, in the, what, what did you see in that sort of the private uh, area of markets? Because, you know, t- to me and to, to many uh, listening to this podcast, they you know might read the Wall Street Journal every day, but the world of, of private markets is, is, is kind of beyond their observation just because it's, it's uh, you know, not as observable. Well, private markets uh, have done reasonably well compared to public markets in recent times. The marks have been relatively okay. Obviously, growth capital and venture capital and tech stocks and valuations in the private sector have come down a fair bit. Um, but I, I do think that uh, you'll probably see some uh, continued investment in the kind of things that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. Uh, classic buyouts will probably still get done. Very big buyouts probably won't get done so readily because the debt market may not be there for the biggest of buyouts. But I think there'll be there's a fair amount of debt available for modest sized buyouts. And remember, the banks are not the only people that provide debt anymore. Uh, private equity firms have their own debt capital operations, and many other money management firms do as well. I think overall, I think the uh, investment environment now is actually good for investing because there's uncertainty. Um, prices are lower than they were, and that's usually when you make the best investments. If the prices are sky high and you want to get ahead of, of everybody else and going and pay sky high prices, generally that doesn't have a good outcome. When prices are low and people are afraid of the market, that's generally when you really should invest. You mentioned uh, venture as well as uh, technology as some of the sectors that are struggling the most uh, during this year. 
Uh, how much of that do you think is sector-based versus valuation-based? And, and to, to what do you attribute um, the, the sort of discount rate analysis that, oh, a technology company that right. is going to make most of their profits in 2030, uh, that will be impacted more by a hike in interest rates than a company that's going to make most of its money in 2023 and 2024? Well, remember, if somebody is buying something or investing in something at 30 times earnings or 50 times earnings, what that means is that if the company is going to earn what it's earning now for each of the next 50 years, you would get your money back. Well, companies really don't, you know, go a flat line for 50 years and kind of uh, pay those kind of uh, multiples back. So generally, when people get in a feeding frenzy and they pay 30 times, 40 times, 50 times earnings, and sometimes people are paying 10 and 20 and 30 times revenues for some kind of technology companies, in the end, that always leads to something coming down the air, coming out of that bag. Um, I think people who are buying things at five, six, seven times EBITDA, nine times EBITDA uh, in the buyout world or even low double digits in the technology or venture world or growth capital world are probably going to do much better. But people get carried away. This is the, the, the true of human nature forever. And so people get caught up in these so-called bubbles. And we've seen some bubbles in the technology space and, and um, in, in the venture space. I'm not feeling sorry for the people in that space. They've made a lot of money. And even though the values have come down, they're still generally above the price that they invested in. How do you ascertain as to when the bubble is, is done popping and you can, there really are some bargains? How do you know uh, when it's time to uh, uh, you know, start deploying capital or, or if, if the bubble is still bursting? Well, nobody really is great at predicting bubbles except when they finish, um, they burst. So you know, whenever markets are going up, people think, well, maybe there's got some more value there and maybe that's a fair price. Only when the bubble bursts do people say it's obvious that that was a bubble. So I can't say that I know where there are bubbles right now. I suspect that a lot of the bubbles have burst in technology, for example, or in real estate, some bubbles have burst. But I think overall, uh, you know, you don't really know you've been in a bubble until you see the decline dramatically of the valuations that people are paying. However, you know, historically, when people are paying 20 times, 30 times, 40 times for a company, uh, EBITDA multiples for a company, generally that's kind of a bubble and, and probably that's not a great thing to do. Uh, David, a lot of people listening to this podcast are young people who either want to get into finance or are early in their career in finance. What advice would you have, have for them? Well, for one, uh, you're going to be good in finance if you enjoy it. Don't do it because you just want to make more money. If you think... Uh, the only purpose of being in finance or investing is to making money more than you might make in some other profession and you don't really don't enjoy it, then it probably won't be for you. Um, I think the reason I think finance and investing is a good profession is one, it's very analytical. You get to use your brain. Two, I think, as I say in the book, if you're a good investor, you'll actually allocate capital in a way that's helpful to society and you can say you're helping society. Thank you, uh, David. My, my final question for you is your outlook on the economy. I think it was in the interview you did with Sam Zell, you said how you know, young people on your team or, or Sam Zell's team uh, often write these 100 page memos. And a, a lot of them are about the economy. And some of them might say, oh, the yield curve is inverted. So uh, uh, economic contraction is, is coming. Uh, how do you, you know, so what, number one, what do you, a, a lot of people expect a recession to come in. I actually think as, as a month or two ago, Bloomberg, uh, recession indicator was at 100%. And, you know, this is, right. this is Bloomberg we're talking about. Um, so how, do you, would you agree with that, uh, analysis? And, and, uh, you know, if so, how do you, um, sort of invest, uh, during, during a recession? Well, first, um, this is probably the most predicted recession I've ever seen. People have been predicting it for a year. Eventually, it'll show up probably, and people say, see, I told you so. Right now, I believe that the recession is not 100% certain to happen because the Fed is probably going to modulate their rate increases. And secondly, the um, unemployment rate usually goes up when you have a uh, recession. We have a hard time getting the unemployment to go higher now, in part because there aren't that many people in the workforce. So... The traditional view is get interest rates up. The Fed said they would take them up to, the, to a certain level and get unemployment up. And I think the Fed, while they can't say that publicly, they were probably hoping that unemployment would go to 6%, but it's still at you know 3.7%. So I think they're nervous about jacking up interest rates too much now because it'll have other effects on the economy, not just unemployment. So I, I'm not 100% certain we'll go into recession, but I am 100% certain that if it comes, Everybody will take credit for having predicted it. The, there's a terminal rate of how high the Federal Reserve will get, and that terminal rate is predicted by 
forecasted, predicted by the Federal Reserve, as well as in the interest rate market. I think now it's a little over 5%. Where do you think the peak of the mountain will be in terms of when will the Federal Reserve stop hiking? And I would suspect a little bit over 5% is probably where the Fed will probably take it at the peak, but it depends on a number of factors that we don't know now. I doubt the Fed will take it above 5.5%, but nobody knows for certain. I do think the Fed will at some point say, we don't need to have the inflation rate go to 2%. I think 3% would be probably tolerable by the markets. And so I think that would require the Fed to not increase quite as much because the increase to get to 2% inflation is going to be very, very difficult to do and have uh, side effects in the economy that I think are not desirable. I think the, the, the business world, the economy can live with 3% inflation. Mm. Well, David, thank you so much. It's been an All absolute right. pleasure to get to hear your views. Okay. Uh, the book is How to Invest, Masters on the Craft. Thank you very much. Thank you.